Dr. Ayana Abrams is a licensed clinical psychologist, CEO, founder of Ascension Behavioral Health, and co-founder of Not So Strong, an initiative to improve the mental health and relationship functioning of black women through use of vulnerable storytelling. Her specialties include racism-based drama, uh, trauma, mood disorder treatment, burnout prevention, and helping people create and recreate healthy, romantic, friendship, career, and familiar relationships. She has extensive clinical and research experience working with black people across the diaspora and has been featured as a speaker or contributing writer in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Essence, We Work, Vice, and Allure magazines, Therapy for Black Girls, and Silence to Shame. She is also a contributing author to the book Emotionally Focused Therapy for African American Couples, Love Heals, uh, published in the fall of 2021. Welcome, Ayana Abrams. Thank you for having me. Sounds like it's been such a wonderful, wonderful day. I'm looking at the chat and I love when the chat turns into like a group chat for women. Like so I see everybody supporting each other and offering a ton of information. I love, love, love that. Um, well, thank you for that um, welcome. I, I'm glad that you all are able to join us today for this really important conversation. Um, about shame and infertility and fertility in the Black community. Um, I have a wonderful lineup of panelists, so I'd like them to first introduce themselves before we get into the, com into the conversation. So we could start with Tamara Hunter. Hi, Dr. Ayana. Hello, panelists. Hello, everyone that's viewing. Thank you, PSI, for this opportunity. My name is Tamara Hunter. I'm a perinatal mental health therapist, founder of Womb Wisdom Wellness. I specialize in supporting women navigating fertility, pregnancy, pregnancy loss, and postpartum challenges by empowering them to prioritize their mental and emotional wellness. I also host a podcast called Womb Wisdom, uh, it's a platform for Black women to share their reproductive mental health and maternal mental health journeys. And I am also a survivor of infertility, which included fibroids, endometriosis, and cysts, pregnancy loss, and survived postpartum depression and anxiety. And I have a spirited six-year-old daughter, so it was worth it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Raquel? Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Raquel. I currently serve as the Director of Integrative and Preventive Medicine at Care at Fertility, um, and I'm also CEO of the Fertility Advantage. Um, as a director of a, of a leading global fertility benefits um, provider, we really work with multinational employers to provide a fertility benefit to their employees. Um, and what's really special about this is that I get to work with a team of people um, who just make sure that no matter your race, sex, gender, or your sexual orientation, you have access to high quality fertility care. Um, completely outside of work, it's just my personal philosophy um, that having access to equitable health information is it shouldn't be a privilege but a fundamental right for all black women um so i look forward to diving deeper with you all today absolutely we gotta get, gotta get you and tia together like that should be a whole th we gonna talk we gonna talk. okay okay um and regina a broken brown egg can you introduce yourself Sure. Hi, I am Regina Townsend. I'm the founder of The Broken Brown Egg, which started as a blog, but it is a nonprofit organization committed to empowering, informing, and advocating for those experiencing infertility with an emphasis on the Black experience of it, um, because we're often left out of the conversation. And I didn't see anyone that looks like me, and I felt like, well, if somebody got to talk, I ain't going to shut up. And so that's what I've been doing. Um, for almost 13 years now, and it uh, was born from my own experience with infertility. It took us 10 years to reach our son, uh, very similar to what Tamara said. My five-year-old is also my employer um, and bosses us around and told me this very day that I give him too many conversations. So <laughs> it is, a I was, he basically told me I was doing too much. So it has been my honor to help Black women feel seen help us have these conversations intergenerationally um, and change the landscape of how we access care. 
you know, and what you're, what you're mentioning really speaks to, you know, why we are here today and have created this kind of platform, because oftentimes, right, our voices are not in the conversation and we're not making the decisions for ourselves and our families and our own bodies. Um, and it has really required, one, us telling the truth about that, and then two, us saying we're going to do it ourselves. We're not going to wait to be taken care of. We are going to resource ourselves. So I really appreciate that. Right. And Joanna, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Joanna Pinegras. I am a veterinarian and freelance medical writer, and I specialize in writing on various pet care topics for pet parents. My husband and I struggled for several years with infertility. I had two miscarriages about eight months apart, and I went through several rounds of IVF before welcoming our beautiful son, KD, into the world. He just turned seven months old this week. And I am very passionate about sharing my story and essentially doing my part to break the silence, shame, and stigma around infertility, especially for Black women. Thank you all for being here. Right. So we are going to start right off with Regina, right? So you have created an entire community to help people understand fertility and infertility and all the experiences right in between and beyond that. And you've also been really open with us and on your website and in the community about your own family's experiences. Can you share a little bit more with our audience about what you and your family have gone through? It is one of my preferred soapboxes because you find that when people start talking about it, you go, oh, that was, oh, okay, I get it. Um, so we got married very young. Uh, we decided that we were going to wait a couple years and you're thinking, well, we have time. And then we were 25 and realized that nothing was happening. And I was dealing with extremely long periods and did not know, didn't connect the dots that that was an indication that something might be off fertility wise. I just thought, well, you know, periods, they do their thing. They don't always do what they're supposed to do. And it took a long time to actually get a diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome and understanding that there may be male factor issues as well and understanding that I could ask for a second opinion. All of those things took years. Um, and the, spe the, the specific issues of it in terms of being a black woman was I didn't have the history of being able to ask a doctor something directly and feel confident that I was gonna be heard. I didn't necessarily always have health insurance. I didn't have access to fertility resources near my community on the South side of Chicago. Um, so it took us an extremely long time. We also endeavored to uh, pursue adoption through kinship care, and then that fell through. And nobody had told us that these things came with such an emotional and mental health uh, weight on them. And so a lot of it was, there's a lot of stop and start medically, but there's a lot of stop and start financially, and there's a lot of stop and start emotionally, and there's a lot of stop and start culturally. And we didn't know any of that. And so starting the blog and, and really trying to learn how to speak up for myself, helped me to get to the point where we were in a position to pursue IVF. And that's how we were able to conceive our son. Thank you for sharing that. You know, what you were noting <clears throat> um, that was happening within, right, and kind of around your story were so many systemic impacts, right, of how you now then experienced fertility issues, right? So when we talk about either lack of education around this and I'm quite frankly miseducation right of black people right around our bodies right yes. um, and the policing of our bodies rather than the education about it the topic right that yes. all these things factor into right how you experience any of this right access to resources right and whether that means access by way of what's close to you in like physical proximity or access in terms of care that feels you know culturally responsive and safe for you. And when you don't have access to those things, it remarkably changes your experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tell us why, um, why do you, and why have you been so transparent about all of this? Why have you been telling your story and, and soapbox and a shouting it from the rooftops? 
I think, well, one thing is when I'm angry, um, I've just always been that vocal person. I was the kid that was on the school council, the student council. I was the one that's going to tell the teacher, you know, over here in the disciplinary code, you gonna have to let me go to the bathroom because it says it right here. I was that person. I was that kid. And advocacy has just always been a part of what I do. I serve teenagers now as a public librarian. I do the same thing with them. The advocacy part is big. But the other thing was the more that I started talking about it in my own space, the more that I had relatives going, oh, that was my story too. I just, you know, we just decided we weren't going to have kids or, oh, that was my situation too. And so we did this procedure and I sat there and I thought, so y'all just, y'all just want to tell nobody that this was a thing. We're going to have to say that this is a thing. Um, and it became important also for my own mental health. There were so many moments where I felt stifled. You can't talk about this. You shouldn't be broadcasting this. You're going to be judged for this. All of that weight was adding on to what I was already dealing with. It takes a lot to pretend like you got it all going on. And it was not all going on. And I wanted to put that down for myself and for somebody else. So the more that I tell my story, the more other people are comfortable saying, well, if she could say it, I'm gonna say it. <laughs> and if they needed a platform, I wanted to be that space that was a safe space for someone to say, you know, I'm really happy for my sister. I'm happy for my best friend. I'm happy for everybody. I'm really sad for me or I'm angry. I wanted people to feel comfortable saying that and having a space. So. I try to be transparent. It's part of my self-care. Being transparent is a, is self-care, especially for Black women. And what I always, you know, then in, in working with so many Black people and families and, and couples in particular, right, oftentimes like self-care is community care for us, right? It's not only about us and our bodies. We're not in a, you know, in a bubble or a vacuum, um, but us being able to continue to resource each other and kind of break a lot of those cycles is what you're talking about, right? That, that community care is the way in which we take care of ourselves, right? Okay, and I see so many head nods across the panel. Okay, I'm gonna move through this, okay. Dr. Raquel, so you are a naturopathic fertility specialist. Can you tell us what that means? I recognize that even you know earlier today, the, the terms that we are most familiar with in terms of, of medical care is an OBGYN or even a reproductive endocrinologist, but I'm not sure the community knows much about a naturopathic fertility specialist. Give us, give us the goods. Yes, yes, I love that question because I feel like when I first got started, that was everybody, everybody's question was like, what's a naturopathic doctor? Like, what does that mean? Um, and I really feel super grateful that I even found this medicine. Just as a really quick backstory, I went to UGA. So even though I live in LA, I'm like a Georgia girl through and through. Um, so I went to UGA and then I went to Mercer um, and it was in graduate school that I really realized that there was something about the determinants of health. There was something about what we were learning um, about people getting well that was much larger than for disease X, give medicine Y. And so I always knew that I wanted to practice medicine, but not in its current framework. I knew that there had to be a specialty that really looked at the root cause of disease. Um, and so that's what naturopathic doctors do. We believe in the body's innate ability to heal itself. And what that means is that we believe that in the right circumstances, you can heal yourself with the right doctors, with the right information, with the right access, you can get the care that you deserve. And so that's what led me to naturopathic medicine. And so when I first got to LA, one of my first jobs was with the fertility doctor um, in Beverly Hills. So I largely believe in integrative medicine, meaning that you have to know like your strong suit. You have to know like, I can only do this much and then you're gonna need another doctor to help with the rest. And so I had a really, really great opportunity to work with a fertility doctor in Beverly Hills. And he hired me to really look at some of the root causes of subfertility and infertility because he was noticing that a lot of young women were having unexplained infertility and he didn't really have the bandwidth to figure out why. Um, and so my job was to look at micronutrient deficiencies, look at heavy metal toxicity, look at chronic disease, hypertension, poor diet, look at how all of these things play a role in your fertility. And it was really special work because together we had a success rate of about 97%. So people either got pregnant on their own or they had a successful next IVF or IUI cycle. But I wanna bring this in. This was in Beverly Hills to a very specialized group of people. And to me, that's just not fair, right? So I'm able to do this like great care. We're able to help all of these white people get pregnant. Name um, it. Name it. 
Yeah. And so to me, I felt very stuck. I felt like, oh my God, more people have to know about this. Like, are you, you know, is your doctor checking for diabetes? Is your doctor checking for hypertension? It seems like it does not matter, but it is very integral to your fertility health. Um, so that's what naturopathic medicine is, is all about, is really helping you to look at what things are beneath the surface that could be leading to your diagnosis. Thank you for sharing that. And I just saw a comment um, that says reproductive health and reproductive justice. That's mm -hmm. the difference of it, right? Recognizing um, the inequities of it all, right? And, and what can be done to fill in some of those gaps, right? Because oftentimes, again, as I was saying earlier, we can't count on our counterparts to fill in those gaps, right? They don't care enough, they give up, right? We will talk about medical racism um, uh, as well as kind of how this impacts things, right? But it sounds like that for you was filling in that gap. So I'm hearing that as like a common thread. I noticed something wasn't happening. I wasn't seeing something Right. And I chose to be an advocate to be able to fill in some of those gaps. Because a lot of, I think sometimes ob guys and reproductive endocrinologists get a bad rap because they really don't have time. They load their schedules with so many patients that unfortunately he just was not not going to ask about your diet. Mm. He just didn't have time for that. He wasn't going to ask about your diet. He wasn't going to check like your blood pressure, which I think is insane, or even, you know, understand what it means to check for heavy metals. Well, so many of us may have been exposed to mercury. A lot of my patients that had unexplained infertility have been exposed to high levels of mercury. And when you remove that, they immediately got pregnant on their own, like without his help at all. Um, and so I totally agree that that sometimes we do have to send in the gap to say, what is it my doctor looking at? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going we gonna to Mercury. Oh, everybody writing that down. <laughs> Asking for blood work, right? Different ways in which we can advocate for ourselves because in the event that the provider, right, doesn't offer something or, or note something, if you can pull some information from today's conversations, you get to go and ask for those yeah. things. You get to say that and advocate for yourself. And if they say no to whatever that is, you also have to get to ask them to document it. Hey, I asked for blood work and you said I didn't need it. Can you put that in my chart that you said? I didn't need it. I just want to make sure we're all clear here. Because they're definitely going to do it. <laughs> yes, yes, right? So, so we also know that there are <clears throat> so many, right, factors that can contribute to infertility, right? And some of, us, some of you have already shared some personal anecdotes. Um, but, you know, specific to um, Dr. Raquel and Regina, can you say more about your personal experiences and, and the medical experience about what these factors are? You had mentioned PCOS before. You had mentioned fibroids, endometriosis. Can you say more about how those um, can impact fertility? I'll defer to, to Raquel for the okay. medical part of it, but I will say um, for me, having those lengthy periods, but no one ever actually explaining why that might be happening. There was a lot of times, especially when I was without insurance, where I spent hours at the clinic hours at the emergency room waiting to be seen. And when I did get seen, it was, well, here's birth control pills. Mm -hmm. And I kind of understood in the terms of, well, this is a clinic and they're not my primary. Okay, fine. But when I did get insurance, that system stayed the same. I would have a doctor, I would go and say, this is an issue. And it would still be, well, here's some birth control pills. That'll stop the period. And I kept saying, well, but that's counterproductive kind of to what I'm trying to do. It wasn't until I started the blog and started explaining what was going on that actually a reproductive endocrinologist from St. Louis was visiting Chicago, invited me to lunch and said, I think you might have PCOS. You should talk to your doctor about it. I didn't even know what PCOS was to have asked before that. So that's where I feel in terms of some of these medical issues that we could be asking more about, there's a definite education gap about the fact that some of these things existed. As a child, I heard plenty of commercials on the radio about fibroid treatment, but I was never told what fibroids were. It was just thrown in. I mean, I know, I think Atlanta has a V103 also and Chicago does as well. So here on V103, the black station, it would be like, there's a new treatment for fibroids, but I never knew what they were. So all of these issues, endometriosis, adenomyosis, uh, all of these things, we don't even know what they are to inquire about them. So when I finally realized that there was a hormonal imbalance happening that was affecting how my body was dealing with everything that I ate, everything that I did, why I wasn't losing weight when everyone else was, then I could kind of address that. Eventually, I, my, my tubes were completely blocked, 
but I could have saved so much more time had I known in the first place that those things even existed. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I think PCOS is so common now, like more people are realizing that PCOS is of course, like one of the most common endocrinopathies of reproductive age women. But I think what people don't realize is that it's the disease process. There is no treatment, but it's how PCOS affects our fertility. And oftentimes it's because of the insulin resistance. Um, and so a lot of doctors will totally overlook the fact that a patient does have elevated hemoglobin A1C or this repeated history. Um, of like high blood glucose and go straight to ovulation induction. But like Regina is saying, that is a treatment of symptoms. If you take letrozole or clomid, that is to help you to ovulate, but it's not getting to the root cause of your PCOS. Um, and so when you think about a patient with PCOS, I know like whenever we work as a team, we always look at comorbidity. So like diabetes or, you know, um, metabolic syndrome, because what'll happen is if you have this obesity or if you have elevated hemoglobin, what happens is that it doesn't even, it doesn't only the insulin doesn't only affect your ability to ovulate, but it can cause you to have absent, absent or irregular menstrual cycles and even cause you to have um, repeated miscarriages. This is all due to chronically ele elevated insulin, but unfortunately it's not a part of the treatment plan. The treatment plan for PCOS is getting the patient to ovulate and getting them pregnant, but it causes you to have long-term health consequences of PCOS. Um, so it's incredibly important to find a doctor that is willing to look at things like your blood sugar, seeing if you have diabetes, metabolic syndrome, because if you work at the root cause of these things, it can help to improve your outcomes. And I know I saw a couple of people talking about thyroid. Um, so your thyroid, I feel like now it is more common in fertility treatment. So more doctors do check your thyroid and give you um, some type of medication to bring it down. But if you have hyper or hypothyroidism, it can also lead to repeated miscarriages. It can also affect your menstrual cycles and your ovulation. Um, and I was doing research the other day and this blew my mind. Um, there was a, an article about hypertension and fertility and I never saw that link before. Um, and I think it was from the American Heart Association and they showed that 58% of black women have high blood pressure in comparison to 41% of white women. Now, if you tie that to fertility, when you have hypertension or high blood pressure, it not only leads to an increased risk of pregnancy loss, miscarriage, but it increases your risk of miscarriage by 20% for every 10 millimeters of mercury um, that your diastolic blood pressure is raised. So if you think about that, black women have high blood pressure and blood pressure affects fertility like this but no doctor in your fertility evaluation is looking at your hypertension or looking at your blood pressure. Um, and so I thought that was such an important link to really pay attention to when we're going to get our fertility evaluations. Like, I know you're looking at my thyroid and my ovarian reserve markers, but could you also check my blood pressure? Could you also, you know, check for diabetes as well? Because all of these things play a part. Can you just come to the doctor with us for the <laughs> like, how do we do this? Like, how do we just, just have y'all? <laughs> what do we do? Let's talk afterwards. Like we just, right? Because that's the advocacy part, right? If we don't know that these are even things to be looking for and asking for, right? We, we will trust the authorities, right? And the way in which, uh, you know, kind of medicine as a as its own kind of systemic issue, right? Has been passed down is that you don't ask questions. Oh, they yeah. are the authority. They should know your body better than you should versus like, no, no, no. I'm the expert on my body. You are the expert on medicine. We've got to pair this information. Yes. Right. We're collaborating on this. You are not the authority on my body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Getting my blood pressure up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Joanna. All right. So you just told us, right. So you have six months. You said his name's KD. Yes. KD. KD. Um, and you have also shared that you have had, um, I think you mentioned years of experiences with infertility and multiple IVF cycles. Can you talk to our audience about how you and your family navigated finding out what you needed from medical providers, how you chose IVF versus any other processes. Just walk us through some of that. Sure, so my husband and I, we're actually, um, we receive our care through a major hospital system in Atlanta, Emory. So I really didn't do much navigating in terms of finding a doctor. Um, I essentially worked with whoever was available at my time. Um, but I can say that from my first miscarriage in December 2018 until I graduated from IVF in December of 2020, 
that I received excellent, excellent care. Um, every doctor, every nurse, every nurse practitioner, they had excellent bedside manner. When I had my first miscarriage in December, 2018, I had just found out I was pregnant. And I went the very next day to my OB's office. And it was at that appointment where I had the ultrasound and the nurse practitioner said, there's no fetal heartbeat. And that was when it was like that the rug got pulled out from under me and life just immediately changed. And so from finding out I was pregnant until having a dilation and curatage surgery to remove the products of conception from my uterus, it was a week and a half. And it was all right before Christmas. So complete emotional overwhelm, whirlwind, what's going on? This wasn't supposed to happen. And the nurse practitioner, she was just amazing. She was empathetic. She was understanding. She was patient with answering all of our questions, keeping us up to date on all of my test results. Like I feel like during such a difficult time, mm -hmm. she didn't treat me like just a patient. Like she saw me as a whole person and as a whole woman going through a very, very difficult experience. I had the same experience when I had my second miscarriage. And in terms of transitioning to IVF, I knew immediately after my second miscarriage, natural conception is off the table. I can't go through this emotionally again. And my husband was completely supportive of that. But I knew that I wasn't ready to stop trying. So for me, it was same fight, different strategy. So we were referred to the reproductive clinic through Emory and was assigned to our doctor. And I cannot say enough about our doctor and our nurse. Um, still very empathetic, understanding, patient. They showed that they actually cared about us as people and not just as patients. And that meant so much to both of us because you know, I'm still grieving my miscarriages. Um, I've been working with a maternal mental health therapist for several years, and that helped me work through my grief, um, understand what grief was, and learn different self-care strategies to take care of myself, put myself first, so that I could continue to move forward with life while still honoring those losses and being able to get to the other side of them. I was coming into IVF with emotional baggage from pregnancy loss. And our doctor, I mean, she was amazing. And in terms of like getting what, what I needed from, from my doctors, it's, I think it's what Dr. Raquel and Regina have spoken to. You advocate for yourself. You have to come forward and get the information, ask the questions. So we pretty much always have like a page of questions every time we spoke with our doctor um, because it's like, this is my body. Mm -hmm. IVF is intense. It's expensive. It is everything. And I want to know what's going on. I want to know what my body is going to be going through before we even get started. So always asking questions and asking questions until we got the answers that we felt like we needed. Mm -hmm. You know, I firmly believe in you need to advocate for yourself. Ask the questions. No question is stupid. Do what you need to do to get the information that you need to be able to make informed choices for your health and for your body. So I feel very fortunate that I had great doctors. Mm -hmm with and that they were patient and saw me as a full person and saw me as a woman going through something very difficult and they didn't brush off any of my concerns that that kind of, that, that, that kind of care all right sounds remarkably important right for it for anybody as you move through this experience Right. And it, it, and in in what you were offering us, right? It sounds like you were naming 
what support looked like for you. I heard you first mention that you had a, uh, or have a very supportive um, partner, supportive medical care, and also sought the support um, through um, a mental, a maternal mental health therapist, right? Would you say that um, that any other support has been important for you throughout that time or now? Yes. Um, from the very beginning, our friends and family, their support was everything. And I don't say that lightly. Um, we have very close friends and family, and they essentially rode that emotional roller coaster with us. They cheered us on, they laughed with us, they prayed for us, they made themselves available um, to meet for coffee pre pandemic, <laughs> talk on the phone, um, you know, all of those emotional support type things, those non tangible mechanisms of support. I know that I really needed that. Um, venting about the frustrations with IVF and, and pregnancy loss. And is this ever going to happen for me? Because with every loss, with every setback in IVF, I felt like motherhood kept on slipping further and further away. Mm -hmm. There were times when I was so frustrated that I couldn't pray for myself. So I felt very grateful that I had family and friends who would pray for me when I could pray for myself. And because of that support that I received, that's the kind of support that I want to give to other women because I see how important it was for me. And so when I speak to women who have experienced pregnancy loss, who are going through IVF or maybe contemplating going through IVF, I want to be that listening ear. I want to be that person that they can essentially let their hair down with, can, you know, talk about whatever they need to talk about, feel however they need to feel, and they know that they can talk with me and they won't be judged. It'll be a safe space. And I won't, <laughs> I won't give them an unhelpful cliche, like just relax. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having that safe space where, you know, a woman can just be real about what's happening and I can give them that support that I received from my friends and family. That those are the kinds of um, spaces and relationships and conversations um, that really help us to decrease or eradicate the shame that's oftentimes associated, right, with <clears throat> um, what your body is or is not doing, right? Yeah. To to one, not only have narratives, right, and kind of have some validation, right, but also when you find yourself kind of moving into that critical space, particularly in terms of how society views, how, how society can reduce a woman's body to her fertility, right, well, you're supposed to do that, so why can't you um, really being able to have spaces, right, that says you didn't do anything wrong, you are not bad, you are not deficient, right, because this is an experience that you are having. Yeah, thank you for sharing your story. I'm see, I, and I hope you're also checking the chat to see the support that you're getting in the chat, right? From you know, women who people who don't know you who want to ride for you right now, right? So I hope you're able to to check out the group chat, right? So Tamara, I've been waiting, I've been waiting, right? <laughs> therapist who works with people, right, who works with everything that we have been um, talking about today. So you work with a wide range of uh, pregnancy-related experiences. What are the most common um, presenting issues when people make it to your office or when people, people make that first call or reach to you? Yes. So, I mean, there are nuances related to with infertility with various communities. However, I find some of the commonalities I pick the most common across the board, mm -hmm. um, the internal and external struggles, and then they kind of mesh as well. Um, most of the internal struggles that I work with through with my clients are that shame and guilt while we're here today. <laughs> the shame and guilt, um, which is compounded of past choices, right? Maybe you had released a pregnancy in the past. Maybe you had partners in the past that, you know, 
weren't worth your time, but you stayed in those relationships a little bit longer. And now you're advanced maternal age, which I hate all of those labels that they put on us, right? Um, it's not calling it geriatric. Now it's advanced because before yeah, that was it was geriatric, advanced maternal age, incompetent service, you know, all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have all these labels now that you're um, having to contend with and, and it affects your, your self-esteem, right? Um, who you are and how you see yourself in the world. Right. And then, you know, career choices as black women, you know, I know I was taught go to school, get those degrees, you'll have time. But nobody said you don't really have that much time. And, you know, the conversation that your eggs um, are diminishing as you get older. I never had that conversation with anyone in my family, my community, no one. It wasn't until I was 30 something that I knew that. Right. And so having those conversations, those real conversations that did not happen and now being faced with that um, that shame and guilt comes up in that area. Um, the shame and guilt of whatever particular lifestyle you may have been living, partying, you know, then the guilt and blaming yourself, or maybe I shouldn't, I, mean, I drank too much in college, or, you know, I smoke a little weed, or, you know, those type of things. Oh, I was on birth control pills for so long, and maybe that was it. Um, just ruminating and playing it over and over in, in my clients' heads, and my own <laughs> as well, when I was going through, you know, my journey as well. Um, Spirituality is tested, tested, you know, why me? Why, why is God punishing me for maybe some of those pregnancies that I did release in the past, right? Maybe he's punishing me for that partner that I knew I shouldn't have stayed in that relationship with for as long as I did, but I stayed anyway, right? So we work through that. Um, difficulty connecting with God, praying, right? Because now you're angry with God, okay? It's like, you know, why are you doing this to me, right? And so a lot of times, you know, I tell my clients what my mother told me, somebody else will pray for you. If you can't pray right now, that's okay. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for my client. You know, um, your, your friends, your family, they're going to stand in that gap for you and pray for you, right? When you're unable to. Um, and that disconnection with body, that shame, that dissociation with your body, like my body failed me because those cultural constructs say as black women, you know, you know, yes, we birthed the nation. However, you know, some of that, those remnants from enslavement are now passed down to us. It's in our DNA, right? It's, it's in society. We're supposed to be able to, to, to birth, you know, eight, nine, 10 kids, right? So what does that say about me as a black woman that I'm unable at this time to bring forth life, right? So we work through the physical, emotional, um, mental trauma of the process of going to infertility, hearing that diagnosis, writing letters to your body. We do that a lot. If they're not able to, we start small, you know, writing a letter. If you're angry, say that. And then we try and work through that and just start connecting, you know, connecting with, um, with, with your body. So my approach is to really help women see where those blocks are, right? Understand the blocks and then start doing that work to start chipping away, breaking it down, so we can will to us what we want, what we know we deserve, what we have a right to have, right? And so making room for what's coming, right? And so the external contributors, I find, we talked about this earlier, with late diagnosis of fibroids, PCOS, endometriosis, um, block, uh, over, ovary, um, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> fallopian tube, right? Mm -hmm. Yes having those, those blocks. I know for myself, I suffered with bad periods for, I mean, I had my cycle very early since high school until my thirties. I was on all kinds of med medications. I told my doctors, something is not right. I don't understand why I'm so in pain that I can't go to work. Oh, just take this medication. You don't have endometriosis. Well, how do you know? Cause you don't. Not knowing that you can't just, you have to actually go inside and see if I have endometriosis, right? medical mismanagement, just brushing me off. So when I did get to that point of, had to have emergency surgery for my cyst, what did I find out? Endometriosis, nine fibroids, all of this stuff that I did not know that I had, but I knew something was wrong and nobody would listen to me. So what does that then do? Delay your reproductive process, right? Now you have three months. I was lucky that was three months, but it could take longer, right? You start another IVF treatment, Unfortunately, sometimes the fertility treatments causes some of those cysts. Fibroids grow back. I mean, my doctor, he was like, listen, we took it out, but we got to act fast because, you know, 
they, they grow like roaches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to move fast, but what if you're not able to because of financial costs? And then, you know, the fibroids are growing back. So now you have to have a surgery again. So the, the, the delay of a diagnosis, it, it really impacts you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, all of the areas, right? Finances, navigating insurance companies. Um, that would be, that probably was number one <laughs> as far as the barriers that you know, myself and other clients have experienced um, out-of-pocket expenses. I was lucky enough to live in New York where they did cover three treatments. I live in Georgia, they do not cover it, right? So now you're faced with the emotional trauma of having to accept, okay, this is what my body's going through. Then you have this financial trauma as well, right? Um, and culturally insensitive providers. I've myself and have, <laughs> have other clients who've experienced um, just very cold and not explaining the process, concerns ignored, um, lack of transparency as far as treatment options, never been referred to an endocrine, endocrinologist, reproductive endocrinologist, didn't have extensive test blood work done. And I'm asking these questions to my clients and I'm like, well, did they do this? Did they No, they're like, oh, let's try again. And I'm like, no, don't try again. This is what you need to ask them for, extensive blood work, right? Um, simple things. I've had clients who've had multiple losses and then when they were pregnant again, something as simple as progesterone. Why did the, the doctor not prescribe progesterone suppositories? I'm like, I tell them, no, you need to ask them for this. You cannot go through this again. Something as simple as that and they were able to sustain their pregnancy, but they weren't told that, you know? Um, not often surclages. I've had clients who've had multiple losses and I'm like, you can't, we can't do, we can't go through this again, right? We're, this is too much. You need to ask them. I know I think it's recommended at 16 weeks, but you ask them if it can be earlier because you aren't making it to 16 weeks. Ask them if you can have a surclage early. And once they've asked, they like, sure, but they never offered, you know? So it goes back to the education. But if I didn't have those experiences myself, I wouldn't know to tell someone else, you know? Um, and not referring them to support groups or a maternal mental health therapist or just addressing the emotional piece that is involved with this process, right? So, and then of course we're at COVID. So that trauma of going to treatment by yourself, not having your partner with you. And I, the part about, even if it's, you, you're, you don't have a partner, having a support system because when you're hearing all these terminologies it's so hard to take it all in and remember and when you get home you don't really remember as you don't really really I remember my husband I was like they said he's like that's not what they said I was sitting right there but if it wasn't for him I would have told myself this whole story that wasn't true because it was something that was happening in my head and so that's been the struggle right now going through treatments in the pandemic and not having you know a support person in the, the room with them yeah, and and a few of a few things that you were noting just to to be able to move on to, Dr. Raquel was was this experience of medical racism, right? And oftentimes, um, what what people think racism is is this very overt act or behavior or name, right? And oftentimes, right, what racism looks like is <clears throat> um, this privilege that I don't need to like think right about you and about your specific and or and or about your cultural history right that the information i'm going to give you is based on what i have studied which is typically based on white bodies right the science is rooted in um, white bodies and white care right so even if i am not saying something that is outrightly um, offensive or dismissive to you, which is, a, which is another facet of racism, um, me not paying attention to you, right, is also rooted in, right, the white supremacy of it all. I don't need to, to give you as much regard and or you should know what to ask me. So if you don't ask, then, you know, why, why do you expect me to do so much for you as, as um, your provider? So Dr. Raquel, right, because we know that that racism exists, right, a number of these different ways, and it's had a huge bearing, you know, on the health and well-being of Black families, can you speak to what you have noticed? You were alluding to it a little bit before, but can you speak to what you've noticed in the field um, and any any areas in which, in which you have seen any progress? Yeah, yeah, no, I love this question because I recently um, gave a 
presentation to some of our cor corporate partners on the history of racism in healthcare. Um, and it always makes me think of this story of James Marion Sims, which I'm sure like a lot of the panel have heard of, um, but he was known as like the father of modern gynecology, um, but he really used these like gruesome dehumanizing experience on enslaved black women um, in an effort to like repair vesicle vaginal fistulas. Um, and what's really disgusting about it is that in one of his autobiographies, he really wrote about how he was trying to repair vesicle vaginal fistulas, and he really just brought like exclaimed about cutting their genitals again and again and again in an attempt to repair these fistulas. Um, and just to note, these, these surgeries were done without the Black women's consent and without anesthetic. So this was during slavery. So he was doing these techniques with no anesthesia, oftentimes killing the women and their unborn children. Um, and so whenever I hear stories about this and this disregard for Black women bodies during slavery, it makes sense that we see these medical disparities today, especially with the Black maternal health crisis. I know there was like recent data from the CDC that said that Black women are three to four times more likely um, to experience a pregnancy-related death in comparison to white women. Um, and this is one of the widest of all disparities um, in healthcare. And just for context, because I always like to put it in like terms of other um, diseases that we suffer with, Black women are 22% more likely to die from heart disease than a white woman, 71% more likely to die from cervical cancer, but 243% more likely to die during childbirth. And so whenever I hear that, the first thing that pops in my head is how we were treated during slavery. And I know people always say like there are things that are passed down generally, generationally, but the way that the doctors treated Black women then and the way they treat them now, it's almost mirrored. It's mm -hmm. not by chance that this was happening then and now Black women are having these problems during childbirth, regardless of education, regardless of income, regardless of access. It's just something about this lived experience of being a Black woman. And so I know there is so much research to show how our pain was disregarded in slavery and how our pain is disregarded now. It's like a mirror. And for some reason, people aren't seeing this systemic thread. Like the doctors that were present then that were in Montgomery with James Marion Sims, they have this same belief system now. Um, and so I can't necessarily say that the stats are getting better. I think like research was ju just came out a few weeks ago that it's getting worse. But what I will say that I've noticed is that Black women are becoming more aware and they are becoming advocates for themselves. So what I've noticed like in the employer space is that a lot more Black women are advocating to have doulas as a part of their birth um, process or midwives um, as a part of their birthing process. So although medicine is still being raggedy, I can, I can tell that more Black women are saying like, this is not it. Like, no, like I have my ob gyn trust my ob guy. I want them here, but I also want somebody here to advocate me just in case things start to go wrong. Yeah, thank you all for sharing, you know, a number of a number of terms and a number of questions and kind of ways, right, that um, people can also continue to advocate for themselves. Um, I wanted to talk to Regina a little bit more, right, because while it's important for us to know, you know, what it is that we do need and how to kind of, um, you know, um, build out our toolbox, right, in this way. Can you talk about things that you actually found unsupportive as you were moving through your experiences or things that you hear people tell you that were actually unsupportive for them? Wow, that's a loaded one. It is. <laughs> a little bit of time. That, that is a loaded one. And I think one of the big ones, especially in the Black community, is faith. Mm. It becomes, are you praying enough? Did you pay your tithes? Are you sure you're going to the right church? You know, if your faith was stronger, mm. you know, and I saw it in the chat and this is no shade on that, but just to bring it in. Mm -hmm. I know for me, dealing with a period that was lasting 60 days, I really didn't want to listen to about the one with the issue of the blood no more mm. because she ain't walking, he ain't walking down my street physically for me to go touch him. So that's not helpful. And I don't want to hear about Sarah because I don't want to wait until I'm 90. Mm -hmm. And I think that those things were difficult for me and a lot of other people who were like, you know what, that's cool and all, but if this is how you all are going to respond, I'm just not coming. Mm -hmm. And if you're only going to recognize those people who have living, breathing children on Mother's Day, then I'm just not coming. 
And I think that that was a real heavy thing for myself and a lot of people is that culturally we have been conditioned to counter affect our pain with faith. And while that is a good and wonderful thing, there are gaps in it. Mm -hmm. And we don't often think about the fact that our faith has also been colonized in a lot of ways. And it's very easy to get someone to subdue to your will when you're telling them that it's God's will. And Ooh. so we've been conditioned to think, well, I know what I feel, but I can't be mad at God. And I know this, this doctor should have treated me that way, but I'm supposed to just be, I'm supposed to be kind. And I know that my boss was rude, but the word says I should work as unto the Lord. So you're conflicted with all of these things and it's just not being taught well. Mm -hmm. And so that part was huge. The faith part, the feeling that I did everything right. I did what they told me to do. I went to school. I got the degree. I got married. I wasn't just shacking. I did everything they said this didn't work. And yet when I go to church and try to get an answer for why this didn't work, it's then again placed on me. And now it's my fault again, because I'm not praying enough now. And now I got to do, it's, it was so heavy and so insurmountable that at that point you just are like, well, you know, I'm just going to sit here because clearly I'm not good enough. I'm not worth enough. It doesn't matter that I'm in pain. It doesn't matter that I don't. And then I, we were also, I saw in the chat talking about the, the finance part. And I saw that as a heavy thing because then people are like, well, just save up and you can get the treatment and you can do the thing, but you're missing the emotional guilt that says, and the societal guilt that says, well, if you can't afford this, what you trying to have kids for anyway? This is what's wrong with black women anyway. Y'all got so now I'm carrying the weight of the whole world and my personal world. And y'all done told me to get married. So now I got this man over here who don't have the kid that he need. And y'all also told me if I don't give him what I need, I'm in jeopardy of losing him. We don't have so a falling apart all day long. <laughs> Can not they, helpful. <laughs> yeah, we another hour or we got to we got to wrap this up soon because that in and of itself I'm I am looking at this chat on fire on fire right about the ways in which um people think that they are helping and offering and serving and that's really that's not what empathy is right and there there are significant empathy gaps right when people think that this is what you need to hear because Either that's all, that's the only way in which they know how to support, or they're having a hard time tolerating your distress, so they need it to go away in some way. Um, but it increases that shame and that blame and that guilt and that doubt when they say too much, right? Oftentimes what might be helpful is you just sitting here with me, just getting in the ring with me, and you don't need to tell me anything else. That's the hardest lesson, and I, I try to sit, tell people we have a real shortage of what pardon my French, but what my family would say is a sit your ass down. There's a real shortage of just sit your ass down. You don't have to say everything. Just sit down. If you would sit in this moment with me, we can both get through this. But now I don't even have my support group because I've now decided I can't talk to you about I nothing. To you. Yeah. Just sit down. Now I'm Just even more sense. isolated and I'm even more at risk, right? In terms of the stressors that come with that and allostatic load and mental health issues, right? That it really compounds all of that versus people asking you, right? What is it that would be helpful from me versus me determining what I think help is for you, right? Um, we could go many, many different direct see having me as a moderator i'll be talking too much so um i don't know are we are we taking q a in this particular segment because there are some questions that i think they've had some answers to them but okay okay so i did see <clears throat> um some questions there is one person asking it sounds like this might be for dr raquel um, can you discuss secondary infertility, uh, meaning having a child and then having difficulty having another child? Um, it's an issue that's not well known about, especially in uh, the Black community. Can anybody speak to that? I'm still laughing at Regina, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
It's funny because we did a literally a panel with with Cora Jakes Coleman, and she still was the same way. Like, I know you love God, but look, we've been talking. But anyway, um, yeah, so it's super common because oftentimes we think, oh, you had a child already. So the next time it'll be, you know, the same, you won't have any trouble. Um, but secondary, secondary infertility is just as common. So if you're noticing that you stop breastfeeding, because that's the first thing, when you are breastfeeding, it does make it a little bit harder to get pregnant. So you do want to make sure that you're giving yourself sufficient time when you stop breastfeeding to start trying again. And if you notice that you are under 35 and it's been a full year and you haven't got, gotten pregnant again or over 35 and it's been six months and you haven't gotten pregnant again, then you want to make sure that you either go to your ob -GYN. Some ob are open to um, checking your ovarian reserve markers and doing like a transvaginal ultrasound. But sometimes they'll say, no, that's not in my wheelhouse. And they'll refer you um, to a reproductive endocrine so the biggest thing is to make sure that if you are noticing that it is taking you a little bit of time, that you have a provider that's willing to do a thorough analysis to let you know that, okay, yeah, you might have had a, a easy time the first time around, but now we are seeing some like abnormalities that could be affecting you getting pregnant now. Okay. Thank you for that information. Um, we have another question um, about how can African-American people seeking fertility treatments, IVF, et cetera, find um, Black reproductive endocrinologists and or find also people who are, um, who are as talented as you, Dr. Raquel? Uh, it's so sad because I live in LA and it's like insane how many fertility doctors there aren't. There was a couple that reached out to me um, like via my website because now like working with um, a benefits company. I don't have the bandwidth to see patients as much, but I was trying to find them a black fertility doctor in LA. And I found two in this big state, like two and one was in Glendale. That's not even LA, <laughs> but it's, it was literally so hard to just find a black doctor. One thing that I really like that I feel like has been like super helpful. There's a doctor in Atlanta that I love. Her name is Dr. McCarthy Keith. She works mm. at um, Shady Grove, right? She's amazing, but I try to refer everybody to her. But one thing I do love to do is that if you don't have a black provider in your area, I always say to book a consultation with a black doctor. And that way you can tell them like, these are my concerns. This is what I need. And they can be like an advocate or like an adjunct to your care. So although they're not your main provider, they can say, okay, I'm in Atlanta or, you know, I'm in San Francisco. So I can't help you with all of your treatment, but this is what you need. You need this blood work, you need this imaging, and then they can really work with another doctor to make sure that you get the care you need. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, and I've seen, I, I saw, see, saw it in the chat as well, um, but there was a question um, that I can answer about, <clears throat> um, you know, how we can continue to educate our community and how to have these, and on how to have these conversations that we can all kind of offer more support. Um, and what I always recommend is conversations like this, make sure that this doesn't stop here right? What are ways in which you can take this conversation outside? So if you're taking notes, share those notes with people who you know, and not just women and not just Black women, share those notes with people who you know, right? So while this information is absolutely you know, important for us, what does it mean for other communities to also learn some of these things? So if there are nuggets that you put it on your social media, right? Send out a, a something to, to a few people in your email, right? If you have an email list or just people in your family, right? Just offering people information to keep this conversation going, that this should not stop right here. This will, there will be a replay of this. Post this on your social media. Put this somewhere so that more people have access to the communication, to the information, not only the 300 people who were able to show up in these, you know, specific hours, um, but as you are gathering information, right? Share that. Do not stop with that here. And that is how we continue to build more community conversations around this, right? They don't have to be as formal as this. They don't have to be linked to an event and kind of all this stuff. These, these nuggets, these terms are really important. Do, your own, so do some of your own research. Ask your medical providers about these things to kind of expand this conversation so that it doesn't stop here, right? I thank you all for joining us today. I think that there have been a ton of links um, in the chat for, for them to, to get in contact with all of us across our websites, our social media resources that we have on our sites. Um, I think all of us are really active in, in different ways in the community. So there's ways in get, to get in contact with all of us. But thank you all for being here uh, today. Thank you all for sharing your very, very valuable, important and vulnerable stories. And I wish you all very, very well. Thank you.